What's up, y'all? This is Dr. Austin Shane. With me, as always, badass strength coach in Denver, Colorado, Alex Friedman. Today, we're going to start with a little bit of a freestyle. So, Alex, I heard you were at the Factory X, um, was it the banquet yesterday? It, it looks the, dope. Right. Um, yeah, Coach Mark Montoya called the Leg Legends and Legacy um, banquet or ceremony. Uh, last night and the whole theme of the, the night was legends and legacy as far as how do you create legends and then what is the legacy that you're going to lead so yeah. i thought that was a super cool topic especially going into a new year thinking about like inspiration and motivation it's like you know and one of the lines they said was an inheritance is what you leave for somebody right it was yeah. a, a physical thing that you leave somebody a legacy is what you leave inside of them Right. So it's like the the morals, the character that you can inspire people with or that you can um, motivate people with or the the memories that they have of you. And so part of the theme was what's going to be your legacy? What is, what is the one parting gift you want to give to everybody that they're going to carry on in their heart, that they're going to carry on in their mind? So I thought that was a really um a really deep message. And I know it stems a lot from his recent struggles with kidney cancer, right? So he just had surgery a week and a half ago and um, essentially beat it, right? He, uh, I think it was a cancerous mass, but it's been on his kidney for four or five years. And, um, and he fought through the surgery and everything. And, and one, a big part of his speech was he's like going through this whole process. I was thinking of my legacy is like, what if I die in this process? You know, cancer is a hugely like sobering topic. Right. Yeah. And so, and one of the things that he said that, that was, you know, he, I kind of found in retrospect, like immensely badass. He says, he's like, you know, and throughout this whole process, if I died, you know, I was going with a smile. I was fine mm -hmm. with it. I've lived the life that I wanted to live, you know? And so, <laughs> I think that's just a really interesting topic because like living life you want to live or like accomplishing the goals you have, like, I think it's very seldom that you end up exactly where you plan to be. Right. Yeah. So you have the yeah. goal, I'm going to do this. And and even Mark said this, he's like, my goal was not to be, you know, owning factory X coaching the UFC or whatever. He's like, I found my way here just through happenstance, but I'm ultimately super grateful and happy about where I'm at which I feel like a lot of people's life journey, like it's, it's so hard to find like the predictability of life. Like I'm going to do this thing. And then you stay on that journey for like 30 years. Right. Well, you just, you kind of fall into your niche, right? You yeah. like, not everybody can plan what they want to do and, and kind of run through exactly what they want to do. Sometimes you just like fucking fall into it and you, and you, it just turns out you're good at something that you never thought you were going to be good at, or you're great at something you never thought you were going to be good at. Like Alex, what's, what do you want to leave? What's, what's the legacy you want to leave oh, man. for was, people when you're done? I was planning to hit you with the heavy questions. Too bad. Like I'm asking you. Um, you know, I, and I kind of been thinking about this a lot, you know, I feel as though like the transition from in college, like the big question was like, who am I? What, what is yeah. my thing? Who am I as a person? What do I like? Um, what are my core values? How am I going to live those out? Who's my partner, et cetera, like things like that. And I feel like more recently into like young adulthood, um, the question has been like, what is the most important thing to me? Or what is, what are my value system and how do I act on those on a daily basis? Right. Mm -hmm. So if I had to answer that right now, my legacy is I, I want to leave behind a, a sense of, of a loving relationship. Like I want people that have come into contact with me to feel appreciated, to feel loved and to genuinely, you know, respect and love themselves more because they have interacted with me. Right. Yeah. And so I, that's what I've been striving to do in a lot of my relationships, like be a, a, a genuinely good listener. And, and hear people and hear their truth and see where they're at. And then if I can show them some wisdom, if I can um, just listen to them, or if I can um, relate to them and, and see where I'm at, you know, as a coach, one of the biggest pieces of coaching that I've always held on to is like, it's more than just physical exercises, it's more than technique, 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 this technique, that what it is to me is like, I'm trying to help you further your human experience and your growth 
you know, right. not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, all of that. And so I want well, anybody well, what's, that I coach. Pause. Uh, what's, what's cool, because I don't think a lot, like, at least me, when I think about like what I want to do, it's not necessarily like interactions. What you're saying is your goal is to have genuine interactions with every, with as many people as you can. Right. You're in like, when I think about my goals. Yeah, of course that's it. But I don't think about the fine tuned details of the interaction is probably the most important part. Like you're breaking it down a step further than most people do. Instead of like focusing on like the leg, like the big aspect of the legacy, you're focusing on the micro transactions or the micro interactions of every single person you touch. Well, absolutely. And I think that that comes from a little bit of awareness and understanding like as much as anybody else, I like to have these big meta conversations, like, like what's the meaning of life? What's the big question, this big question that like, I, I think those are really fun conversations, but at the end of the day, if you don't bring those down to an actual level, um, they're not going anywhere. They're just yeah. theory, right. In a world full of experience and practice. So how can I take my life value and theories and et cetera into the real world? And what I've found on is it's through relationships and it's through conversations and it's through experiences with people, which again, people do subconsciously all the time, right? Like if, if you're seeking somebody to confide in, like you're just going to hang out your friend. You're not, yeah. you don't think about it stepwise and be like, okay, I'm really struggling with this. I need to vent to somebody. Let me call Austin or whatever. Like, you just call Austin, you know? So, right. but it, it, it's been an interesting journey for me to think of uh, like social interaction or socializing through a more um, purposeful or more meaningful lens and, and see like, what is the genuine value of this interaction? What's the, inter what's the value of every single interaction and yeah. how can I best be myself and then convey and communicate that point that I told you that I want everybody to feel appreciated and loved or at least love themselves more from interacting with me. So it's like, how can I communicate that? And even like, even the 30 second or like two second high buys that you go through every day yeah. that happen all the time. So, um, again, trying to live that more outward, I think will help me and myself feel more fulfilled. So it's partially a, a selfish goal too. For right? sure. I want to feel personable. I want to feel, um, that, that I've been fulfilled in my mission. So the best way to do that is to serve others. And, and that's genuinely what I've been after, you know, and I, I frame it through coaching because that's, you know, what I do. That's my profession. Mm -hmm. So I frame it through coaching, but that exists everywhere in my life. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and that's a cool thing too, because like the, the, I guess the lower the amount of I guess, big picture ideas that go into it. So like focusing on the interaction portion, it allows you to change more people's lives. Like, I mean, it, I've said it on here multiple times. Like my, one of my legacies is I want to be in a history book. I loved reading history books. I looked up to those people. Like that was something that I've always, I've dreamed of in my entire life is that I, those are the people that I looked up to growing up. And I, and I think it would be cool that in the future, if that was something that people looked up at me, because that was always something that, I held really true in my head that my biggest, I guess, influences in life were the people that did great things. Yeah. And I want people to think that about me because I do great things. But when I say that, and you don't put steps by steps by steps, you can kind of get lost along the way. Right, if you that, focus on the interaction portion and you make it, I just want to change as many people's lives as possible. I want, I want to help as many people as possible. I want them to feel a genuine connection with me when they talk to me. Then that allows me to do that. That allows me to break it down in every interaction I have. I have a specific goal of, I want to help that person. I actually want to hear that person. I don't so, just want to talk. I want to listen. Right. And so I think that's, that's the real goal is help as many people as possible. And then I think the, the being written about in history books, like that's the extrinsic factor. That's the, that's the, for lack of better term, that's like the side product, right? Like, yeah, you know, exactly. And so, and I think where people error a lot is they go off after that extrinsic value first, right? Yeah. It's like, and then through the process, you end up finding your way to your intrinsic value or to your uh, actionable steps. But it's like, you know, one of my life goals is to write a book, you know? Yeah. And I feel like, if I go and I sit down and part of this, you have to do intentional work, right? You have to sit down, like you have to have the purpose. I'm going to write a book right now, mm -hmm. but I feel like I'm, I'm definitely at a stage in my life. Like 
if I tried to write a book, it would just be writing a book for a book's sake, right? Yep. Like the book that I want to write or that extrinsic goal has to be motivated and fed by an internal goal. And, and I'm making steps to that almost every day. Like, um, and I'm talking about myself a lot, but I've started to write down like more rules for my life, right? Like yeah. I, I, I have the two rules that I've held true to for a long time, which um, are um, don't be a dick is the first one, which, yeah, you know, good rule, good rule. Right. Um, and then the second one is do your fucking job. Right? Yeah. And so uh, obviously I extrapolate those to more than just the, the simple base value of them. But I think I've, I found the third one and that speaks to, again, a lot of my shows right now, or a lot of the internal conflict or the internal growth I'm going through, which is say it with your chest. Like, yeah. I think that that's, something that I'm trying to develop and grow into more. So I think that's eventually going to be the bare bones and the backbone of my book. But yeah. I think if I tried to write it right now, it would be grasping at straws and trying to fill it. Like, especially you with your, your idea of being in a history book, right? If you're thinking right now, it's like, what's the most impactful, easiest step to be written about in a history book right now? Right. Exactly. It, and, it's, it's not going to happen. Right. Or, yeah. or it's going to be, less meaningful than what you know you want to be in a history book for right right so that's, Ex exactly that's that i found very well like my thing in the one limiting factor i guess of people thinking about this is that i've been told so i've been saying that for since i was fucking like 12 <laughs> like because that's when and i can after this i'll bring it back to when i knew that's what i wanted but the limiting factor in having this conversation and figuring out what do you really want your legacy to be is most people almost look down on you for thinking about the, the end stages. They almost look down on you for being like cocky, like, oh, this is what I want to accomplish with my life. Right. This is, if you say you want to accomplish great things, there's so many people that say, oh, you think you can do that? Oh, you like, oh, you think that you're that important that that can happen? You know how many times when I say, oh yeah, I, I want to be in a history book that people are like, you should shoot lower or, right. or you, you really think that that's, that's the main goal. That's what you should be. But then I bring it back to the reason why I say this and one of the reasons I got into healthcare and why I, I wanted to dedicate my life to helping as many people as possible, which is how I want to get into a history book is I read, well, there's two things I read when I was 12, when I was yeah sixth grade, I read a biography project on the Mayo brothers and I learned all about the Mayo brothers and I learned about the hospital system they created. And I learned the beginning stages of how they started helping so many people. They became the specialist. They became the people that could fix other people's problems that nobody else could. And they created this system that helped so millions of people all from their ideas in there in history books that like it's, it's, it was something that I could look up to, to, to see that that could be done. That's something that could be accomplished if you work hard enough and you have the right place in your heart for helping people. Like when I say I want to be in a history book, it's not like, oh, I just want people to write about me. That sounds that sounds fucking cocky. Yeah. But that's what people think when you say it. And the other thing, like the other those two main reasons I got into fucking healthcare outside of me loving what I do is I also watched a movie like it sounds dumb, but it's called Patch Adams. Like, you know, I've talked about this. It's my favorite movie ever. But it's crazy that this one guy that he had this goal of just wanting to help as many people as possible through these different methods that were a little bit contradictory to what people normally thought helped so many people and changed, changed so many people's lives that somebody wanted to write about him. Somebody wanted to make a movie about him because he helped so many people. Yeah. And that's the other side of the equation where there's all these people that are going to shit on you. Like, you know how many, like, like I said, so many people have told me that a, you're a cocky prick or B like you should probably shoot a little bit lower, but they just don't understand that that is the end product of all of the other things you want to do. That's the end goal. When you say legacy, legacy is the end goal. Yeah. All of the other things that get you there are going to be, the stuff that you work your ass off for and also comes from a genuine place of caring, loving, wanting to help as many people as possible because you could get into a history book by being a fucking murderer. You can get into a history book by being a Genghis Khan. You can get into a history book by being Alexander the Great. 
or you can do it by changing as many lives as possible in a beneficial healthcare way. Right. It's not just one like one goal or one way to get there. But I feel like I'm rambling, but it's just one of those things like this is a topic that I hold dear to me because so many like I've said this so many times in my life and it's almost like this this conversation's hard to have. And it's not I know it's not just me cuz I've talked to other people that think like me that they don't even want to say it anymore. It's almost like you have to hide what you want your legacy to be. <laughs> right. And I think that's an interesting perspective. And I think um, two things. I think you might get that reaction, one, because of the way you communicate it, right? Like, I, yeah, I, for I, sure. I, I know you well enough to know that you're not going to say something again. You're not going to say it um, half-ass or like candidly. You're going to like point blank deliver to people, right? So yeah. I think that that's part of the reaction. Like people get defensive and then um quite honestly people are probably intimidated by that it's like this man this guy has his goals so clearly laid out he knows what he wants to do i know that was my initial reaction it was like what the fuck am i about and without even thinking about it we're like what am i about you know i'm not fucked up he's fucked up so yeah. he's a cocky prick right so yeah. i think that's that's a lot of reaction which is essentially just being a hater right yeah. um and and that's one one big thing i think a lot of people the reactions that they have speak more about themselves than about you Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Austin, I hate to say it, but sometimes you're probably a, a, a cocky prick. Oh, I'm a thousand percent a cocky prick. A hundred percent. But at times you need that. Right. You have to be a dreamer. You have to shoot high if you're going to get high. Right. If you're going to accomplish the, the mm -hmm. goals that you put in front of you, you have to shoot that high. So one thing that's been interesting to me and it's like it's almost as though we have opposite paths. Right. Like I, I'm, I'm finding my way as I go. I'm trying to you know, live each microtransaction to the next, find the next pivot, the next purpose or whatever. Um, one thing that you, you've said really well is like, you've known your goal or you've known more or less your legacy since you're 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you've gone after that, but I'm curious, like what are stages or what are places that you really felt like you had to pivot, you had to change, you had to um, really shift your quote unquote, your plan to be in a history book. Ooh. Um, there you go. There's that hard question. There you go. Well, here's the cocky prick answer is like, it sounds bad, but I really haven't had to yet. <laughs> um, I mean, to be completely honest, it's kind of gone as planned so far. Okay. <laughs> like I, I, I did undergrad in three years. I did my doctorate, my master's in three years, and I started a business right out of school and it's, I'm on trajectory to do what I want to do. But I mean, there's, there's obviously like I got married I, I never really thought I was going to get married. Then I met the love of my life and your boy got married. I'm going to have kids. That wasn't expected. I mean, not now. This isn't a pregnancy announcement, but we're planning <laughs> to have kids at some point. Like um, there's so far, I haven't really had to pivot much, but it's, it's coming. I guarantee it's coming. <laughs> and it's, it's one of those things that well, I guess, if, I guess if I had to, if I had to pivot, or if I had to think about things like I didn't do what I wanted to do in college wrestling and that, that taught me, that taught me a lot about myself when I realized that I wasn't going to be an Olympic level wrestler. Um, that taught me a lot about myself and, and what my values were and where, like, I always knew that healthcare was what I wanted to do, but I thought I was going to be able to accomplish some other shit along the way. Right. Um, but I guess, I guess me, a being just a straight pussy in college and being hurt all the time and not taking it seriously, but also B not accomplishing what I wanted to accomplish forced me to find what my priorities actually were. Yeah. And, and I guess resolidify what I already knew, which was I'm more than just an athlete. That's not how I'm going to change the world. Yeah. I can change the world by my brain and by working with people and by being compassionate and I guess empathetic. Yeah. I think that's really cool. And I think that's, you know, if there was a place, I think it's that that's where we can bring combat sports into this legacy talk. You know, there are going to be people that are the super athlete, the elite, Fuck, elite yeah. the world champion that are going to influence the world or leave their legacy by being the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Like, that's the 1% of the 1%, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, but I think with legacy and with, you know, character development or sports and like sports book character, quote unquote, blah, blah, blah. I think that's the biggest part about wrestling and combat sports is the, the humility factor that it brings, yep. right? Everybody talks about the grind, the work ethic. You learn to be 
accountable and reliant and and while all that's good and well and great like yes you do get those life lessons from wrestling the other the bigger i think life lesson from wrestling is like it's about you it's on you like you are the only one responsible for mm-hmm. your fate or destiny right and when things don't work out for 99 percent of them they don't right like how many olympic champions are there versus middle school or high school wrestlers right mm-hmm. so for 99 percent of people your wrestling dreams don't work out so you have to learn the humility aspect you have to learn to honestly reflect on yourself to be aware of your shortcomings to really uh, analyze yourself and then you know and then from there you make a decision like okay i'm going to get after it in this sense now i'm going to be successful at this and then and then you're probably honestly still a little bit delusional and don't think you're successful or don't think that you you've accomplished what you want but you have the tools you know, based on the hard work, based on the the process, based on everything else that wrestling gives you. I think the real benefit from either wrestling or combat sports, mixed martial arts is the accountability, the ownership and the humility that it brings you on a daily basis. Because, again, for 99 percent of us, there's always somebody better in the next room over or in the same yeah. room that you're in. No, I mean, you're right. There's no there's no better feeling than being out on the mat and getting your hand raised. And there's no worse feeling, at least for me, than being out on that mat and knowing that you just had a really good match and you still got beat. Like, I remember I've only gotten fucked up twice in my life. Corey Clark beat the shit out of me when I was in seventh grade, and that pissed me off. He cradled me, and I've I've gotten pinned four. I can count on one hand the amount of times I've gotten pinned in my life. Corey Clark went out there and demolished me. And he ended up being a national champ at Iowa, so that made me at least a consolation (laughs) prize. But, yeah, justification. but, and I just remembered feeling so shitty about myself after that because I went in there and I didn't even wrestle bad and he just fucked me up. <laughs> and then when we were in college, well, I went to university nationals. I wrestled freestyle. I wrestled a kid named Evan Henderson, who's still on the circuit. And he just beat the living shit out of me. And I thought I was good. And then he goes out there. He doesn't even win the tournament. And I'm like, I literally like the, I went out there. I thought I did fine. I got fucked up. And then that guy doesn't even go out there and make the finals. And I'm like, oh, I just learned a lot about my, that was literally the moment where I was like, all right, well, this isn't what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Like, this isn't for me. And that humility and that, like that reason, like me realizing that and what wrestling did for me right there allowed me to set to like almost close a chapter. And say, all right, I don't like how this feels, but no matter what, no matter how, because I always was the the guy that would work hard, no matter what amount of hard work I could do, I'm not going to be as good as those guys. I'm just, I I just can't. My body won't do that because for whatever reason, I wasn't born for that type of greatness. And that loss just made me realize, like, I I just, I'm not built for this. I got to move on to the next thing that I can help the most people at. And that was literally why I didn't, I mean, to be completely honest, that and Lisa were the two reasons why I didn't do my fourth year at lacrosse. Right. That, that, that loss right there was when I realized, all right, this isn't for me. I can move on to the next part of my life. That's why you fucking ditched me. Um, yep. But damn, that, that's causing me to reflect a lot on like, uh, first, what you said was like, what are the worst feelings in sport? Right. But second, like, what was the transition? What was the point that you realized you could move on? Um, to me, the worst feelings weren't even in competition like i i came up and my belief system was so that when you're on competition day like that's the day to perform the work is already done and that's that's going to be what it is like that just is what it is right and like yes all all your points are valid and i I felt that but for myself the worst uh feelings in wrestling were getting dogged in the room right We've yeah. all been the dog and we've all gotten dogged, right? If you've been in a wrestling room, there's a guy that's drilling at such a high pace that he's just fucking you up, right? It doesn't matter, like, the technical piece that you're, you're hitting, but you're at a higher pace. You're, you're, you know, mopping the mat with a guy. They can't keep up. They need to take breaks. For me, that was, again, I can think of probably two times. One was my first week in the UW lacrosse room. Right. I was coming in as a 165 pounder and I was drilling with a 141 pounder and Jess Han. Was it me? Him. No, it was Jess Han. <laughs> You're not a pace dog guy. Um, 
but he was like purebred Iowa wrestling style, like, you know, pressure, pressure, pressure move. And we were just drilling, man. Like we were yeah. literally on our feet and I could not keep up with this guy. Like I had to sit on the corner, catch my breath. I had to like stall for tactics. I had to like, I couldn't work on any technique simply because yeah. I couldn't keep up. Right. And so that was a reflection to me. It's like, man, I haven't been doing my job. I'm not, I'm letting myself down because I'm not even ready yeah. to practice, let alone compete. How am I ready to compete if I'm not ready to practice? And so that really fostered with me and, I, and helped me understand. It's like, this is a higher level. This is something that I have to accept. And right. And I think a lot of people and a lot of the motivation and inspiration out there will say, put your head down, work harder, get to that place. Yeah. which I think is, is an acceptable solution to a degree, right? You can't just decide that forever and always or else, you know, I would still be wrestling trying to capture a world title and an Olympic medal, right? right. Like, right. which is, you know, glorious pursuit. And I respect people that do that. Mm -hmm. But the smarter side of me says, okay, that's less realistic. That made me not happen. And, you know, for lack of a better term, like hard work doesn't solve all your problems ever. So- nope. It's all a lot, but not all of them. Right. You have to pivot and adapt. And right. So like, you know, I even think about like motivational quotes that I, I've seen recently or that I watched like Conor McGregor. He's like, there's no talent. I'm not talented. I'm obsessed. Like that very well may be true, but you're fucking talented. Yeah. Like, there, yeah, there, there, there is some fucking talent. Right. So I think a, a genuine understanding of that and then pivoting and adapting to best fit your skill set and find success for yourself is a lot more realistic view of that type of world that wrestling can give you right like mm -hmm. or combat sports any combat sports like you're gonna get humbled and how you react to that humbling or getting dogged or getting beat or getting knocked out or whatever how you react to that excuse me determines the trajectory of your life and your ambition towards your goals and goals mm -hmm. change and shit changes and that's okay yeah well that's what we talked about in our goals and the the don't fall prey to uh, New Year's resolutions podcast where your goals have to change. That shows evolution as a human, right? If your goals don't change, then you're just going to be wasting time on something that you could be moving your or moving your efforts towards something that could make you great. Right. If you never tra change of pace, you're never going to find your true path in life. And a lot of people waste a lot of time on this, this faulty path that's going to end, cause them to have some sort of disgust with themselves at the end. Like that's, how, that's how I felt for about a year. Like I was, I, I realized that it wasn't my path, but for about a year after I stopped wrestling, I was just, sounds terrible to say it, but like kind of just disgusted with myself that I didn't accomplish when I set out to accomplish. Okay. And while I was understanding that I, that I made the right choice in leaving what I was doing, I still felt like shit about myself and it just on, on the inside, it just hurt. Dude, but much, yeah. 10 times out of 10, I would make the decision that I made. No. I, and I think that's hugely important to, to understand too. It's like, it's not and like, you know, you, I cringe at myself a little bit talking about shifting goals, talking about understanding your own limitations or finding your right lane, but it's literally finding your passion and finding the right goal for you. Right. Like how many times, and you know, it, Every wrestler that really gets in it, falls in love with the process, has goals of achieving wrestling excellence, right? Whether that's, mm -hmm. you know, Worlds, Greco, Freestyle, Olympics, whatever. Like, you have those dreams. But understanding your limitations isn't necessarily just giving up on those dreams. Like, there's a certain time for sure to work hard and grind and, like, get to your top level. But I think there's also a time to genuinely reevaluate and assess, which is what mm -hmm. we're talking about. And so, like, as much as it sounds like we're saying, like, give up, be a pussy, whatever, like, it's not that, right? It's being smarter and working more towards what you're passionate about or working more towards your correct path in life, which, yeah. again, is hard because it sounds like we're saying, like, give up on your goals because, you know, probably your coach, your dad, whoever, you know, you're closest with has put that goal in front of you and then you ultimately morphed it into your own goal. And right. it's like, and that's hard to give up, like to say, I'm not going to accomplish what I had hoped I could, right? Mm -hmm. And like to accept that, but that happens, man. It happens on so many different things and it happens on the things that you're most passionate about. Like mm -hmm. nobody wrestling in an elite level is not passionate about wrestling. It, it sucks identity. too much to not be passionate about like, it, to be completely identity, honest. You have to be bought <laughs> and you have to love it to go for that. So 
it's really hard to accept when you see I'm not going to accomplish the game, the things I hoped I would. Right? Well, and, and the, the double-edged sword of this, I guess, is all of the good and great attributes you get from combat sports are why it's hard to accept (laughs) the, the accountability, the tenacity, the, the, um, individuality, the, the self-confidence that you get in yourself, all of those different things are why it's really hard to accept. And, and why, honestly, why I felt again, disgusted with myself. It was hard for me to accept that it was the right thing to do because I had all these other things that I got that all the positive, the best things in my life came from wrestling. They gave me the best attributes of my life. I learned how to be tough. I learned how to go for the throat. I learned how to compete. I learned how to, to be great from, from the sport of wrestling. But that same drive to want to do all those things made me feel like a fucking pussy when I stepped away from it. And it sucks because at some point in everybody's life, you're going to realize that you can't do combat sports or any sports forever. At some point, you have to step away. And some people can get into coaching, like like Jordan Burroughs. Jordan Burroughs is probably, not probably, he's the greatest American wrestler in history. He, he is. But at some point, and I would say probably in the next three or four years, he's going to have to step away from wrestling. Because the unfortunate truth is... When you're 40, you can't be in the you, you can't be the top of the top. You can't beat a 23 year old when you're 40 for the most part. I mean, if anybody can, it's fucking him. But and he's going to have to have that decision, and I guarantee it's going to be a hard one because all of the best things in his life came from basically telling his inner bitch to go away. If I can, if I can quote David Goggins, right. but in all the best things in his life, and that's just what wrestling has taught him. He succeeds when he pushes those feelings deep down. But at some point you have to realize that there's another path you have to take. And the best, the best people, or I guess the most graceful people that go and do great things after, like if we're thinking about sports, like Kobe Bryant's a really good example where they, they want to go do great things after they can shut it down and then they can keep those thoughts inside or talk to a therapist or whatever, and then be able to take all of the good things and move it to a different skill set or take all of the good things and go on a different path because they realize that that path wasn't for them yet. And I think to me, if I could have one skill that could be taught to anybody, but combat athletes in particular, it would be that is knowing, knowing when enough is enough is a skill in it of itself. And I have no clue how to teach it. I have no actionable steps on how to get people to understand it. But if we can find a way to to bottle that up and, and teach it or for people to understand it, that's going to change a lot of people's lives. Yeah, man. And I think there, there are certain individuals that kind of corner the market on this or that have done it really well. Um, that Which, again, is, is a super hard process, but it's like you almost have to remove your identity with the thing whatever Mm -hmm. it is, you know, with the kickboxing, with the hard work, with the grind, with the process, like your identity, as often as we make that, we make the process our identity, right? Like when we were both in college wrestling, right? I was a wrestler. That's Mm -hmm. who and what I was, right? And you have to commit that fully to achieve the greatness and the things that you want to. But at the end of the day, it's like, no, I am not wrestler. I am Alex, right? So it's like, having some of the confidence to pivot, to bet on yourself, to, to move on and change. Like that's, that's some of the hardest things we do is we change. Right. So it's like, I think that that fails itself in a, a a layer of like insecurity, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's hard to bet on yourself and it's hard to see all of these attributes that you have within yourself that now you can go apply to something new. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that, that prospect is, is super scary, but I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile if you're at the right point in your career or if you're at the right point in your, your life. Right. right. So I think the, the self-confidence and self-esteem and then the percep- perspective is huge mm-hmm. on those things. And like, again, going through that process, like that's the human condition. Like that's something that you always have to be working through. Right. And so I envy people that are good at it and I know people that are good at it and I've seen them transfer and be successful. One thing successful, the next thing successful that. And I think it's not, it's not necessarily 
that they're good at three individual things, right? They're confident in themselves. They're good at a process. They're good at, you know, X attribute. And then they can apply it to three different things. Well, they were good at three different things at different points in their life. Right. That's like, like point. if we're, if we're calling like the Kobe Bryant example, there's no way Kobe could have been the business mogul that he was before his untimely passing while he was still an NBA player. Right. He was one of the best NBA players. He realized enough was enough. This is when I need to end. And then he took the skills that he learned from being the great, the greatest of the great and then applied it to a different facet knowing that that part of his light's over. He literally just closed the chapter. It's, it's just a fucking chapter book. He closed the chapter, opened up another one, and said, here, motherfucker, I'll write a great one, and then wrote another great chapter. And those are the people that can make a difference. Like um, another really good example, Shaq. Like if we're going to go with basketball players, like yeah. Shaq went from being one of the best players and uh, one of the best centers in the NBA, closed that chapter book. Now that motherfucker makes a lot of money. He's an ama- He's a He's an, a good analyst an extremely, um, I guess an extremely entertaining person. And he's a very, very smart businessman. And he, the, the, there's no way he could have done that when he was a basketball player. He realized that was a phase of his life. That phase needed to be over. Now I can move on to the next thing, but I'm going to take all the skills I already learned and then apply it to this next thing. Right. And again, yeah, and that's what makes it more impressive when people can do two or three of those things at once, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the the special of the special bit. But if we're being aware and realizing it ourselves, right? We only have so many slices of like this attentional pie. Yeah. And so don't use um, my own words against me. Hell yeah! To decide where <laughs> to aim those is a little bit of a of a challenge, and it's a struggle, man. Like uh, especially when you tie your identity to what you do or or you know your pursuit. Um, which again, double-edged sword, man. If you don't tie your identity to your pursuit, you're definitely not going to get there, but it makes moving on that much harder. So, but I think it it brings the awareness and that's where I can go back to, you know, what I said originally about wrestling, like it brings that humility, right? Mm -hmm. It brings that, like that realization. And I think that's ultimately the best thing it's done in my life is, you know, the hard work, the, the lessons and morals and, and things I love about myself that I've learned from wrestling, you know, those are good. And those are, are things that I love, but the greatest thing was understanding that I'm more than a wrestler and I can accomplish things because I was a wrestler after the fact. Right. Yeah. You can use the skills you learned by being a good wrestler to accomplish everything else in your life. Sure. And that's why, like I tell, I tell everybody, like when I have kids, I'm going to force them to try wrestling. I don't, I honestly, I hope to bat at it to be completely honest, because <laughs> I don't need their joints to be all fucked up and, and to go through honestly what me and everybody I knew growing up went through. Right. But the skills that you learn from even just a couple years of wrestling can be carried with you for life. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I'll say it's the greatest sport in the world. I think it is. A lot of people would argue with me, but I, I think wrestling is the greatest sport in the world because of what it teaches you and what it can teach you about yourself. I don't think there's any other sport on earth that can teach you more about yourself than when you're out there with another human and you're in a basically a controlled physical altercation. Who's going to win? And are, are you going to be, a, are you going to be a prick and you're going to throw a cheap shot? Are you going to be, are you going to play by the rules? Are you going to do whatever it takes to win? Like there's all these different things you can learn about yourself all from one six to seven minute match. Yeah. And man, though, that is that whole paradigm shifts too when you realize you're in control of all those decisions. Right. Yeah. I think that's where the wrestling has the highlight is like you and you alone are responsible and have control over these actions. Right. Where yeah. like different sports don't have that. Well, and so I say, I mean, I agree. People say this saying all the time and I 1000% agree. How you do one thing is how you do all things. And I think wrestling is a real good example of that because I could tell if a kid was a spoiled fucking brat based off the way I wrestled him. I, I could tell, I could tell if that person was a good human based off the way he wrestled. I can tell a lot about that person from just stepping on the line with him, having a six to seven minute match. Maybe he won, maybe I won, but I knew the type of person you were from that six to seven minute exchange, just without even saying a fucking word. Amen. 
And that's, yeah, that's more or less like that reminds me of I went on a college visit and I don't know if this was strictly legal or compliance or whatever, but <laughs> don't get but, yourself yeah. in trouble or I'm anybody not else. Myself, but I'm not going <laughs> to say names, I'm not gonna, but this wrestling coach, he like, give me through the compass. Sure. I hung out with other wrestlers. Sure. had lunch, blah, blah, blah. The main thing that he did, he said, me and you, let's wrestle live. I want to see what type of wrestler you are. Yeah. And we wrestled for, you know, six to 10 minutes or whatever live. And like, of course he beat the shit out of me because he was a college level coach and I was some ignorant high school senior or arrogant yeah. high school senior. Right. But like that was his test and that's how he got to know his recruits. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. I mean, that's my, I, that's one of my favorite things to do. That's why I love going in and coaching wrestling and fight ready so much. Cause I can tell, like if we go, if I go hard and I really turn it up, are you going to break or are you going to give me a fight back? Like I can tell, <laughs> I can tell a lot right there about how you're going to fight too. Like, is, is this somebody that I want to invest my time into? If I turn it up and I, and I can do my thing and I can, and I can break you in just a five minute wrestling exchange, there's no way you hold up in a fight. Get the fuck out of here. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah, but I, a lot about other people is, in addition to learning a lot about yourself too. Fuck. Yeah. But I mean, I, th- I think that's a good spot for the morals and, and, and honestly, this whole freestyle, I got a little, I got a little bit in my feels today. Almost right, cried. A little, a little goosebumps, a little. Yeah. And, and it was relatively nonstop. I didn't really have to say that much. So that, that was, I think that was good. Yeah. But hey, if you guys got to get in touch with us, all of our information is in the show notes. That's going to be both Instagram and our emails. If you have any interest in our building a fighter programs, we're making a push to make some more programs. So speaking of wrestling, we're making wrestling specific programs, not just MMA programs now. And those will be out here in the coming months, probably in the next two to three months, we'll have some programs available for wrestling and wrestling teams. Um, and then as always, this is Dr. Austin Shane. Alex Friedman. And we are out. Out.